Hi, good morning and good evening to everyone. So I'm, I'm very happy to have the chance to present the work uh, in collaboration with Caroline Renault about uh, unbalanced data set and object detection problems. So first, maybe I would like to take the time to thank the Middle Organization Committee for organi organizing this event. And also we would like to thank our colleagues in Paris, Laurence Rouet and Sibel Siofolovait, who were really helpful and supporting in conducting this research. So my name is, uh, is Antoine, I'm, I'm with Philips Research in Paris. And uh, yeah, so first I would like to, to, to describe a little bit the clinical context, state the problem and maybe explain why, why it is not trivial to solve. And then I will get into the details and show some results. So yeah, first, let me show you uh, a couple images in our data set. So we are looking at 2D ultrasound images so of the fetus. So you can see here on the top image, an image of, the, of an abdomen of a fetus on which, in which you can also see the spine. And the bottom image is an example of the head on which, in which you can see a, a substructure called the falx. So here are other examples in the data set. So several example, images of abdomen in which you can see several structures like the spine or the stomach or the umbilical vein and the same for the head. So what is a specificity of our data set and a first difficulty is that the presence of the anatomies uh, are not independent. So for instance, for, like, for obvious anatomical reasons, if you can see the spine, or if you can see the abdomen, or if you can see the umbilical vein, then it means that you're in the abdomen. And the same holds for the substructures of the head. So this is where, uh, yeah, this is the, the, a little bit of the clinical context. So we, what we want to do is really design an anatomy detection software. And for, for some industrial constraints, we had to, to design a, sub, a software able to run in real time. So that's why we decided to use the YOLO architecture. And YOLO is a bit different than other detectors like FastRCNN or FasterRCNN because it's, it's only a one stage de detector. Whereas uh, FasterRCNN, for instance, is a two stage detectors, which means that we do not have access to the same family of method to correct uh, an imbalance in the data set. And here are the anatomies that we want to identify in this software. So there are three main anatomies, the head, the abdomen, and the femur, and several sub-anatomies. So for instance, within the abdomen, we may want to identify the umbilical vein, the stomach, the spine, or the heart. So, yeah. so this is uh, the description of the problem. And this is uh, where the, the, the fun begins. So we have a strong imbalance in the initial distribution of classes in the data set. So for instance, we have uh, in the training data set a bit more, almost 600 images of the head, but we have only 36 images with a heart. So when we train a first neural network to perform this anatomy detection, then we get very good result, results on the head and very poor result on the heart. And the same is true for the cerebellum. We have only 114 images of the cerebellum compared to the rest of the head images. So the first way to, to, to tackle it, maybe a bit naive, would be to say, OK, let me take all images with the cerebellum and duplicate them maybe three times. So I will get as much images of cerebellum as I have images of the femur or of the abdomen. But this actually is a bit dangerous because, as I said, if you see the cerebellum, then it means that you also see the head. So if you duplicate all anatomies with the all images with the cerebellum, then you will also duplicate the corresponding head images. And so you might actually uh, introduce a new bias in the data set and increase the number of heads, which is not really what we want. And so what we will study here is how to do this balancing and not introduce any bias in the data set. So how did we do that? So uh, as I said, we have a strong imbalance in the initial distribution of classes. And if I have n images in the data set, actually what I want to do is find a probability vector p with as many components as there are images. So 
P as n components, such that if I sample my n images with this distribution P, I get each class to be uh, equally frequent. So nothing, no, there is no guarantee that it's possible to find such a vector P, but this is what I would like to solve. So maybe a, a few definitions before I before I start. Uh, I will assume that I have n images in my dataset that I that I will denote by x1, x2, xn and c classes. And I will build this matrix E that I will not uh, spend too much time describing that will really encode uh, the distribution of the labels in the dataset. And this is how the matrix E, uh, this is the math, but this is how the, the matrix E is built. For instance, on a small toy dataset with four images and, and six classes, so I will build a matrix E with four lines and six columns. The first line will correspond to the first image, and there will be a, a one at position at the at the first column is the if the first anatomy is present in the image. So here I have an abdomen and a spine, so I will get a one at the position of the abdomen, a one at the position of the spine, and zero otherwise. For the second image, I can see an abdomen, a spine, and a stomach. So I get an, a one for the abdomen, a one for the spine, a one for the stomach, and zero otherwise. The third row corresponds to the third image with a head and a falc, etc. So this is really how we encode the distribution of the classes within our images. And now, if I use this matrix E, and if I sample my images with the probability distribution P, the expectation with which I'm going to observe each class is given by this formula, which is E transpose times P, up to some normalization factor. And so if I'm looking at making all classes being equally frequent, this is how the problem writes. We want to find a probability vector P which is a probability vector that is such that all components are non-negative and sum up to one, and such that all frequencies f are equal. So it may not be possible to find uh, such um, a probability vector p, but this is the problem that we want to solve. So first, as it's not maybe possible to solve exactly the problem, Rather than trying to make each frequency the same, we will try to minimize the cost, which we can always do. So we'll try to minimize this square distance between the, the, the various frequencies. And on which set do we want to minimize this functional? Well, we want to minimize it on the set of probability vectors. So we want each component of P to be non-negative, and the, we want the components to sum, to, to sum up to 1. And we are lucky because this is a convex set and this is a convex objective function, so it can be very efficiently and easily solved with uh, convex optimization techniques. And so, yeah, this is maybe the, the first problem that we formulate. So actually, let me remind you that pi is the probability with which we are going to sample the image i. And when we solve this, pro this problem, nothing prevents uh, pi to be equals to zero for some, for some images, which is a problem because it means that we will actually never sample them and we will forget them and so we will lose some images in the dataset. So in order not to have this phenomena, we are going to impose another constraint, which is that pi is greater than some parameter alpha to be sure that we do not drop any images in this sampling process. And also, uh, we are going to add some regularization term to the, to the cost uh, to prevent uh, high outliers in P. And this is the problem that we describe and we denote as P of lambda and alpha, where lambda and alpha are two hyperparameters that can be set by the user. And so this is still a convex problem, and so it can still be solved very efficiently. So now I'm going to, to show the results, how it affects the image generator, and also how it affects the, the training results. So the, 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 all the results I'm going to present were obtained on the final test data set of a bit more than 500 images, and I'm going to compare three methods. Uh, the first one, which is basically doing no nothing and sampling the images uniformly in the data generator. Um, the 
classical and maybe a bit naive oversampling strategy that I do, that I uh, described before, where we where we would duplicate the minority classes, and our strategy where we sample the the, the image the images by sol solving this optimization problem. So first, this is the the original distribution in the in the dataset in the training dataset. If I implement classical oversampling and I duplicate the images of the minority classes, which are cerebellum and heart in this case, I will get something that is a bit more balanced, but you can see that there is still a big bias towards the head because we also du duplicated images of the head when we duplicated the images of the cerebellum, and is also maybe a bit biased towards the abdomen. So this is not really satisfactory. And when we solve the problem P of lambda and alpha, we get something we get something that it's much more biased uh, much more balanced sorry in terms of frequency and uh, like the 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 distribution seems um, much more balanced bi biased uh, balanced sorry uh, which is good but now we we do not only want to have something balanced what is interesting in the end is how it affects the network performance so now I'm going to present quickly how our method compares to, with the two other baselines that I described. So when we compare to classical, uh, to uniform sampling, uh, we get uh, consistently better results and we improve especially the performance of the networks on underrepresented under structures, which makes in the end a better overall network in terms of, uh, in terms of mean average precision. And maybe something else that is interesting to notice is that we get lower standard deviation when we train a model several times, which means that the training procedure is more robust. And this is actually quite interesting given the time that it takes to train a neural net. And when I compare to classical oversampling, I also get that consistently the mean average precision is improved. Uh, and so we get a better overall network. So maybe to, to conclude quickly, uh, the, the key idea, I think, is that to tackle this imbalance data set problem, uh, we write the problem as a convex optimization problem, and so we are able to, able to solve this very efficiently and quickly. And the results that we get when we use this, uh, this sampling strategy is a, a better network performance, where the performance is boosted on underrepresented structures, but remains high on the other structures, and therefore does not deteriorate the overall performance of the network. And I think that the natural perspective for, for this would be to extend um, those results to maybe natural images dataset, like the COCO dataset or other medical imaging datasets. And yeah, so I'm going to, to stop there. And if you have any question, I would be happy to answer them. And if you want to reach out to me, uh, during the conference or, or, or after, feel free to, to do so. Thank you.